Can you believe it? It's only a few days away. Christmas gets here in a hurry. I hate what happens afterwards. You spend all that time getting ready, the house looks great, and then it's all got to come down. But it's a great time of year. Do you know what's going to happen tomorrow night? You know what's happening up in the heavens right now? Jupiter and Saturn are aligning. And tomorrow night, they'll be in perfect alignment. That has been traditionally called the Star of Bethlehem. And it's been 800 years. I was just a child. <laughs> 800 years since that was true in the sky. I hope you get a chance to see it tomorrow night. It's really something else. I think there are two questions as we talk about what does it mean to welcome the Christ child? What does it mean to, to journey to the manger? Away in a manger is more than just the name of a song. It's a trip you and I can take. Now, if we were to go to Bethlehem today, we'd be overwhelmed by the commercialism and we'd probably not really get a sense of the holy. But something happened there, and I think it's significant that we talk about love. One of my favorite uh, versions of the Bible is really not a a true version, it's more of a paraphrase and it's the J.B. Phillips um, the J.B. Phillips version of, of um, scripture this comes from uh, 1 Corinthians 13 love is slow to lose patience it looks for a way of being constructive it is neither anxious to impress, nor does it cherish inflated ideas of its own importance. Love has good manners and does not pursue selfish advantage. It's not touchy. It doesn't keep account of evil or gloat over the wickedness of other people. On the contrary, it is glad with all good men when truth prevails. Love knows no end to its endurance, no fading of its hope. It can outlast anything. It is the one thing that still stands when all else has fallen. When we talk about love, and we see it embodied in a feeding trough in a stable in Bethlehem, we get a sense of how important it is for you and I to make a place for Jesus in the story, our story. It's the witness of our lives. What you think about Jesus and how you choose to live in relationship to what you know about Jesus will impact not just your lifetime, but according to what scripture says, will it impact your eternity. You know, I, I think there are two questions that all of us are have to deal with if we're honest with ourselves. The first one is, who am I? In a community like Williams and in many other places, the way to get a handle on who I am is to know my people. I've been reading the history of this community and of your church. And there are a lot of people here who are connected. Would you agree? Greens and Boozers and Ponders and Bonds and Duncans and Williams and on and on it goes. All these folks. So if you were to ask a person who lives in this community, a part of the definition would be, well, here are my people. Well, Jesus, who are your people? The Bible is the story of love, God's love. You might think it's 66 books of a lot of facts and maybe more begets than you ever are interested in knowing. But it tells a story. It's the way God reveals himself to us. And he does it most perfectly 
through the gift of his son. The Bible says in Luke chapter 2, verse 12, this will be a sign for you. You will find a, a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. It's not a normal place to go looking for a king. You'd think he should be born in a palace surrounded by finery, grandeur. There was none of that in that stable. Jesus, who are you? You know, in Matthew and in Luke, we have genealogies that help us to understand how this little one fits into the story, God's story. If you want to know about Jesus and who he is, that's a good place to start. Jesus himself told us about his identity. In the Gospel of John, there are these I am statements. I'm sure you're familiar with some of them. He said, I am the gate. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. So the first question might be, who am I? The second question is, why am I here? You ever ask yourself that question? One of the most beautiful and wonderful women I know is my mother-in-law. I've heard all the mother-in-law jokes. I don't tell them about her because I value my safety. But anyway, um, she's at a point in her life at 89 years of age where she's asking, why am I here? And we remind her how valuable she is to us and how much she means to to not just her family, but to friends, to her church, and on and on. You might remember a book called The Purpose Driven Life. How many of you read The Purpose Driven Life? Rick Warren wrote that bestseller. Millions of people all over the world have read it. I think because a lot of us want to know why, why am I here? You look at this manger and you wonder, why, why then? Why that way? Why that child? Well, if you follow the story as it is told to us through the Gospels, we learn that Jesus had a firm grasp on why he was there. He often spoke of his purpose, of his mission. Remember his visit with Zacchaeus? The, Lee will, the wee little man from the tree. After he went to Zacchaeus' house, he came out to announce, this is why I came. I came to seek and to save the lost. He also said, I have come as a ransom for many. It's hard for us to think of a baby in a manger and a cross at Calvary. But that's where this story's going. He also said, I came that you might have life. Life that is abundant. He said, I didn't come to be served, I came to serve. He also said, I have come to do the will of my Father. He was clear. It's not always to be clear about things. Sometimes we can get distracted or put off by any number of things. And sometimes it happens in the most inconvenient times. A few weeks ago, uh, two weeks ago, I think it was, Pat told us about uh, some of the Christmas music that they enjoyed when he was growing up and some of the, the uh, artists who sang. And one of them was Barbara Streisand. It'd be hard to find someone who had as beautiful a voice as Barbara Streisand. But you, did you know that she suffered from severe stage fright? It was very, very hard for her to get out there and do what she was so gifted in doing. That was also true of a little girl I heard about. For the first time, she was old enough to be in the Christmas pageant at church. Her mother had bought her a brand new white dress. She was beautiful. And the director of the pageant had given her one line to say. 
she was to march out to the center of the stage and say with her hands folded, I am the light of the world. It was a big night. Church was packed. Everybody was in their finest. And the pageant went on and on until it got to that moment when she was to step out on the center of the stage and the spotlight fixed on her so that she could say her line. And she froze. And it was like that. Quiet. And that little girl just stood there. She couldn't see the director because the spotlight was so bright. But over in the wing, just off stage, was her mother. And she saw what was happening to her little girl. She wanted to help so badly, but all she could do was first give her a moment to collect herself, but it was obvious that that wasn't going to work. And so she whispered, I am the light of the world. And the little girl just stood there. And so mother whispered it again. I am the light of the world. She got louder. Still nothing. She did it one more time. I am the light of the world. The little girl finally relaxed and looked over, saw her mother and said, my mom is the light of the world. How do you think people recognize Jesus? Well, according to Luke chapter 2, the shepherds got an angelic concert. I don't know what that must have been like. It wasn't something that they were used to seeing. They were absolutely terrified. And the angel said, don't be afraid. I wonder how well that worked. But they heard the good news of a great joy. And they were compelled to do something about it. You know, at Christmas, you and I know the good news of great joy. But too often we sit on it. Oh, we know how it works. We know the story. We just don't share it very often. When you go into a store these days, you're used to ha hearing certain kind of greetings. What are the greetings you hear at a store or in some other public place? You hear Merry Christmas? What else do you hear? You don't hear anything. Season's greetings, have you heard that one? What's another one? Happy holidays. Happy holidays. That used to bother me when somebody would say happy holidays until I thought about it for a moment and I realized what the word holiday is. You know what, where holiday comes from? Holy day. So when somebody says to you happy holidays, you can say, thank you, happy holy days to you too. Because in recognizing this little one, we join with the angels and with the shepherds to find the promise foretold hundreds and hundreds of years before. And so they got directions. Some people say there must have been a, a woman or two in the group because, you know, men don't ask for directions. But they found their way. And it led them to Mary and Joseph and a baby in a feeding trough. They came to the manger. Later, the mysterious magi will appear. And they'll come to pay homage to this one that they have seen signs of in the sky. Just like we might see tomorrow night, the star of Bethlehem. They saw a star. It led them there. And when they came, they found him and they recognized him for who he was. Not just a baby, not just an infant, but the promise of what God was about in the world. And even old King Herod, hate, hateful, paranoid, vicious 
King Herod. He had his advisors find the evidence of where this little king might be born according to these visitors, these magi. Oh yeah, he recognized him. He recognized him as a threat. And Satan recognized him. Satan recognized him and tried to do everything he could to destroy him. After he was born and throughout his life, even to the point of the cross. And oh yeah, there are ways to recognize him. But how about you? How will you recognize him? Do you know the voice of Jesus? You think, well, I, I, I don't, how could I possibly know the voice? Well, he speaks. If we believe that the Bible is the word of God, then we believe that what we read there helps us to hear the voice of Jesus. In John 10, he put it this way. My sheep hear my voice and follow me. In those days, there would be communal folds of sheep. And several shepherds would be responsible for their own flocks. And they would put them in a, a fold, a, sort of a central fold, so they could protect the sheep. But after the evening was over and the, the morning broke, each shepherd would stand outside that communal fold and he would use whatever sound that was recognized by the sheep. And every shepherd had one of those and still do. It might be a whistle, it might be a pipe, it might be any number of things, but the sheep would recognize the voice of their shepherd and would only follow the shepherd. So Jesus uses that image to help us understand that if we truly follow Jesus, then we learn how to follow his voice. He said, I lay down my life for my sheep. And then he included all of us when he said, I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, for they will listen to my voice. So what would Jesus say to you and me today in the circumstances in which we live with the challenges of this in unprecedented time in history? Well, I think we've already heard. We have heard that we are to, to love as we are loved, to show mercy as we have received mercy, to make sure that we honor the true audience, the only audience that really matters, and that's, that's the one who sent us him. Do you know his voice? It's always interesting how people try to silence the voice of the Lord and sometimes the voice of his people. Every year there are hundreds of thousands of people who are martyred because of the name of Jesus. They lose their lives because they choose to live for him and to die for him. Now it's easy to crowd out that voice. Do you know the name Cadbury? Do any of you buy Cadbury chocolate? You like it? Y'all are really responsive today, I can tell. <laughs> just, you know, may lean over and make sure the other person near you is still w with us. I want to read you a, a something that uh, I ran across. In, Bur in, uh, in London, excuse me, in Birmingham, England, uh, not Alabama, Birmingham, England, there's a, uh, a very large department store named Lewis's. And Lewis's had, had been experiencing um, a lot of good business. They were thriving. And they had made plans to expand. So they got the architect, they developed the plans and everything, but there was one problem. You see, there was a little chapel near their store. It was a Quaker chapel and it was in the way. So the lawyers got together and wrote them a letter. And this is what it says. Dear sirs, 
we wish to extend our premises. We see that your building is right in the way. We wish therefore to buy your building and demolish it so that we can expand our store. We will pay you any price you care to name. If you'll name a price, we'll settle the matter as quickly as possible. A few days went by and another letter showed up. This time from the little Quaker chapel. And this is what it said. We in the friends meeting house note the desire of Lewis's to expand. We observe that our building is right in your way. We would point out, however, that we have been on our site somewhat longer than you have been on yours. And we are determined to stay where we are. We are so determined to stay where we are that we will happily buy Lewis's. If therefore you would like to name a suitable price, we will settle the matter as quickly as possible. Signed, Cadbury. Now it's the church that will, that will stand. You know what Jesus said about it. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Which leads us to ask this question, do we know his vision? I've listened to some of the things that you have done for your community, for some of the families, for the children. I applaud you for that. But it's so consistent with the vision of Christ. In Matthew chapter 25, we have these words, and the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty, gave you something to drink? And when did we see that you were a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing. And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and we visited you? And when was it? And the king will answer them. Truly I say to you that as you did it for the least of these, you have done it for me. What is his vision for the world? That people might experience the love of God, the love that endures, the love that lasts. And finally, do you know his victory? It is hard to think of the shadow over this manger, the shadow of a cross, and to know that by design, by God's plan, a way was made for you and for me to escape the punishment we deserve the fate that was due us. You see, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that means we can't get there on our own. We can't pay for that, no matter how good we think we can be. The good news is that he came that it wasn't on us. Knowing full well that we were incapable, he took our place. I came as a ransom for many. I came to pay your price. Do you know his victory? You know, after the resurrection, some of the disciples had seen the risen Lord. But there was one of the disciples who had not been there. His name was Thomas. And when you hear the word the name Thomas, what do you usually put in front of Thomas? I think he's honest. I mean, how hard was it for the shepherds to believe there was a sky full of angels? How hard was it for Mary to believe that Gabriel had come to deliver the news of the birth of her child? How hard was it for Joseph when the angel visited him. How hard was it for Thomas when they told him that Jesus was alive? They knew he had been slaughtered at the cross, that he'd been treated not like a, just an, a criminal, but that he had suffered the worst, worst form of ex execution that humans have come up with, and we've been pretty good about coming up with ways to kill each other. He was dead and he was buried, and I don't believe it unless I see it for myself. 
So the next time the disciples were gathered, Thomas was there. I, I have an idea that somebody grabbed him by the scruff of the neck and drug him in the room. You're going to be with us. There's somebody we want you to see. And there he was. And Jesus stood before them, bearing the nail prints. And he said, peace be t unto you. And then he looked straight at Thomas. Now, if you were Thomas at that point, what would you be doing? I'd be backing up. Thomas, you want to see for yourself. I'll go more than that. Here, touch. See the wounds that I have borne for you. I don't know that Thomas ever had to do that, but I do know how he responded. And it's a response that I believe is called upon all of us to give. When Thomas saw the risen Lord, he said these words, my Lord and my God. You see, to Thomas at that moment, he realized that Jesus wasn't a baby in a manger. He wasn't the son of a carpenter. He wasn't a great teacher. He wasn't a prophet. He wasn't a miracle worker. He was truly the Lord. He was truly God. And what is so beautiful about that, that confession is that he made it so personal. He didn't say, you are the Lord, you are the God. What did he say? He said, you are my Lord and you are my God. Do you have a sense of his victory? You can journey to the manger. It's empty. You could go to the cross. It's empty. But you know what else? You can go to the tomb. Recently, there have been efforts to try to find the body of Jesus. Our archaeologists and others have been trying to discover the grave that held his bones. And every now and then, you'll hear some story about, well, we found him. No, you didn't. There wasn't a tomb strong enough to hold him. He came on a mission, that little one of Bethlehem. Yeah, they laid him in a manger, wrapped him in swaddling clothes. But when he left that manger... He found himself on a journey. A savior that was hailed by heaven's chorus went on a journey for you and for me so that we, we, we wouldn't have to fear. We wouldn't have to wonder. We wouldn't have to be discouraged. We wouldn't have to be defeated. We wouldn't have to be despairing. He wanted you let not your heart be troubled you believe in God believe also in me in my father's house there are many places if it were not so I would have told you but I go to prepare a place for you that where I am there you may be also the promise of Christmas is far more than the events around Bethlehem. The promise of Christmas is that you matter. John 3.16. Let's say the first part of that together. For God so loved the world. Okay? Now this time, and you don't have to do it out loud if you don't want to, instead of saying for God so loved the world, I want you to say this, for God so loved, and I want you to use your name. For God so loved Mark. that he gave his only begotten son that if I believe in him, I'm not going to perish. I'm not going to be separated from him, but I'm going to know life eternal. Make it personal. Accept this babe for who he is. Be one of his people. Will others recognize him in us? I hope so. 
they will know we are Christians. Why? By our love. The love that endures. The love that lasts. That's why he came. Let's pray together. Our Father, we've been here before. We know the story pretty well. We might even be able to quote Luke chapter 2. The story is just a story unless it becomes a part of our lives. Father, in this time of pandemic, with so much as limited and we can't do some of the things we really want to do with our family, with our friends, perhaps today is the time for us to choose to pray. Specifically, as we did earlier this morning, listed names of people that matter to us. Perhaps it's in writing a card or making a call. Because we can't reach in touch, we have to reach in other ways. And in these days leading up to Christmas, help us to think of others. Help us to do what we can to share the love of Christ in a world that desperately needs it. So, Father, receive our worship today. Inhabit our praise. It is good to be in your house with your people. Help us to share the voice and the vision and the victory of Christ as his followers, as his beloved. In Jesus' name, amen.